Okay, so I know last week was a hard, intense lecture. There was a lot to take in. Um, it used to be a shorter lecture. Um, the content was the content that it needed to be. Um, last year, a lot of students asked for more examples. So I provided worked out examples um, that I included in the lecture. So I know last week's lecture was long, um, but it was to give you the opportunity to have more verbally worked out examples that you could go through. Or like the trust, for example, we only previously went through a few of the cuts, whereas now we went through every single cut. Even though it was very repetitive and it made it quite long, kind of gave you the opportunity to hear me work through the steps. The good news is that was definitely the hardest, longest lecture. Um, we have now finished one side of that strength equation. Last week, we were able to figure out all of the internal loads in every member of a system. We figured out what was happening to the outside of a building or a system or a beam or a floor. And then we were able to figure out what loads that meant we had to design for. And then we were able to figure out what the factored loads were. And then we were able to take those loads, draw ourselves a diagram and figure out the reactions. And then we were able to figure out what the internal forces were using method of sections. And both of those, by following this premise that if it's not moving in space, the sum of everything in Y must be zero, the sum of everything in X must be zero, and the sum of everything spinning about Z must be zero. So now we know everything on that side of the equation. We know the factored loads. We can find MF, VF, CF, TF. We can find all of those internal loads. Now what we need to do is figure out the other side of the equation. I'm going to be honest, I think that that is beyond what we have time to learn in 12 two-hour lectures. Um, I did promise the administration that we would talk briefly about the internal behavior of the materials that resist those loads. But for you to be able to calculate all of those I think is a bit beyond you. I do want you to understand how certain materials behave. But what I think we'll do is talk about the internal ability of material to resist loads. And this follows a principle of stress and strain. And that's what today's lecture is going to be. If we had more time, if this was two courses, we would talk about today's lecture as stress and strain, just talking about axial loads because they're the easiest place to start. If we had another lecture that we could use for this, we would do a whole lecture just on stress and strain for bending and shear. We don't have that luxury, and I don't think it's fair for you to just figure that out on your own because it's pretty complicated. There's some cool derivations and equations that we figure out ourselves, but I don't think that that's fair for you guys. So what I've done is said, all right, we're not going to go into the math behind bending stress and strain and shear stress and strain. Instead, what we'll talk about after this lecture is how each material is built. Literally, what does it look like? Because you probably don't have a lot of experience with that. You're at U of T, one of the best design schools in the world. Um, but because you're so focused on unique, fun, cool, exciting design, it's kind of pretty easy for everybody to forget to tell you the basics. So after this week, over the next few lectures, we're going to take each material and look at the basics of how it goes together. And then we're going to talk about how we might do some preliminary sizing. What we would do if we had more time is do all of that work and then take these principles of stress and strain and actually calculate the final answers. I, again, I think that's too much for you guys, so we're not going to do that, but we are going to talk about the internal principles of stress and strain. Upside, I think I have my camera, my phone, transferring things to my computer. I'm going to test it out here, and I'm going to proceed on that thought process that I'm able to interject each example where I want it to be in this lecture. Hopefully this doesn't bite me in the behind when I go to actually thread them all together. So if there are some hiccups, it could end up being that we have like 15 small videos for this lecture, but I certainly hope that that's not the case. You'll know by the time you see it posted. So let's talk about these internal forces. So let's just remind ourselves about what different types of forces that we talk about. 
We know that we've been talking about axial, and axial is kind of just a broad name for tension and compression, shear, bending, and torsion. Axial forces are all about squashing and stretching something. And it's kind of important to differentiate between tension and compression because some materials behave differently in tension and compression. Some materials behave the exact same, whether they're in tension or compression, except for this, this annoying tendency to buckle. So to demonstrate that, if I had this elastic band and I stretched it in tension, you can see it getting longer. But if I tried to put it in compression, nothing really happens. It buckles, it kind of pops out sideways there. So the material itself, if I could take a small enough, little tiny smidgen of that, it might behave the same in compression. Let's take a look. So if I took this eraser, it's a little bit harder to see. You can see that I can stretch it or I can squash it. I can stretch it or I can squash it. Shear, shear is infinite planes or one single plane trying to slip past each other. What we've drawn here in this image is a whole bunch of those planes stacked together, which is really the principle of how we design in calculus. And that's a principle that we use in a bunch of different things. We use it in electrical engineering, we use it in, um, we use it in structural, we use it in mechanical, we use it in fluid dynamics. This principle of taking tiny little slices, it's what we did when we did method of sections, in fact. Um, we take tiny little slices of things um, and take a look at what's happening at each slice. Um, when you get good at it, you start to be able to know where your slices are the most important. So if I tried to put a shear force in here, it's a little bit hard because this is stiff. If I put it, separate it out a little bit, you can see that I've got my stack all kind of shaped together. And you can see it's taking a square and skewing it into a diamond. Um, so it's kind of like it's pulling, or it, it's kind of, it's, it's really hard to line up with what you guys are looking at. It's trying to pull in that direction and squash in that direction. Bending, bending, we've been able to see that when we put something in bending, it is putting one side in tension and one side in compression. Often we're bending things in this direction where the top is in compression and the bottom is in tension. Our assignment last week, we had something that was moment or connected at the end and had a a force at the tip that was bending it in that direction. So the top was in tension and the bottom was in compression because it was trying to bend like that. If you're ever unsure, and this is what I had said about those complicated ones last week, is that if you're unsure, find something around you, test it, make a prediction about what you think might happen, and then go through the math. Because like I said, what we are we intuitively already need to already know almost everything we need to know about structures. We're just trying to put math to it. And if you find you struggle with math, use your intuition as a check to see if you've done your math correctly. Torsion, we haven't really talked about, but you can see it's kind of a, a combination of moment and a combination of that skewing that we get with shear. So just a refresher, up until now, we've been talking about most things in meters, meters squared, and kilonewtons. So our areas were in meters squared, our distances were in meters, and our forces were in kilonewtons. Because we're engineers and we like to mess with you, I swear that's not the only reason, for a lot of what we do on the capacity side of the equation, we'll actually work in newtons and millimeters. Um, and this is because it depends on the scale of what we're talking about, how we look at it. Um, and so often when we're talking about things um, on the, uh, the capacity side, we're talking about a different scale of numbers. That means we're going to have to be able to go back and forth between kilonewtons and newtons, meters and millimeters, uh, millimeters squared and meters squared. And if you guys remember moment, was kilonewton meters. We were gonna to need to be able to talk about that in newton millimeters. And KPA, which we talked about, was one kilonewton per meter squared. We're gonna to need to talk about MPA, 
which is one Newton per millimeter squared. Um, and so that is this divided by a thousand and then multiplied by a thousand and a thousand. So what we're going to talk about today is stress and strain. Stress and strain, as much as it might sound, sound like a bit of a surprise and something you don't understand, you do intuitively understand. In fact, everything we've been talking about, about force and movement or deflection, internal movements, so we're not talking about that overall flying off into space. We're talking about small scale internal um, deformations. Deformation is almost a different way to think about it than movement. Um, stress and strain are just a different way of talking about those things. Instead of talking about the overall absolute, which is about our specific item, we want to be able to talk about it in a more general way. So rather than that specific building with that specific load, let's talk about it in a more general way. Or that specific member with that specific internal force, let's talk about it in a more general way. So if you want to think about it this way, stress and force are very similar. They're two ways of talking about the same thing, sort of. And strain and deflection are very similar to each other. So stress and strain are to the material as force and deflection or deformation are to an object. So if we have a beam or a column, we're talking about force and deflection. If we're talking about some general unknown size of a material, we're going to talk about stress and strain. But we will be able to convert back and forth. So if we have some unknown size object, we'll talk about it in stress and strain. And then when we find out what actual object of that material we're talking about, we'll convert it into force and we'll convert it into deflection. So like I said, it's easiest to learn these things with axial forces. So stress and force. So remember, stress and force are very similar. If we have a force on this object, when we're talking about stress, we're gonna pretend we're talking about a little block of that element. One unit area of material with stress. So one tiny little unit element of that object is what we're using to talk about stress. Let's take a look at that. Oh, let's talk about strain first. So strain is if we have some unknown force, we're not even gonna talk about what the force is, it causes some deformation to this object. Remember, we, we saw that when you squish this, you can see that these all of these little squares compress a little bit. So we have some deformation of this object. Remember, it's not flying off into space, it's not spinning, it's not going up and down, and it's not moving side to side, but there is internal deformation. Strain is talking about a unit area or a unit volume of that material. And so here's that same principle, but applied to just a little unit of that. So if we cut some internal piece out of this eraser, we this is what we're talking about. So stress is defined as the force per unit area. Um, well, that sounds very similar to um, what we were talking about with a force spread over a zone when we were talking about our loads, KPA, for example. When we're talking about this sometimes about stress, when we're talking about the material itself, we often find it a little bit easier to talk about it in MPA. So as much as KPA could be a stress, we're often talking about pressure or the load, the external load being applied when we're talking about it in KPA. Doesn't make it wrong to talk about it in MPA, and it doesn't make it wrong to talk about stress in KPA, but industry standard tends to be that when we're talking about an applied load, we're talking about it in KPA, and when we're talking about the internal material we talk about it in MPA. So that's usually a good hint to help you figure out what you're talking about. And that is going to be the system we use when we talk about things in this course. So stress is force divided by area. 
we're going to talk about our force in newtons in this. So if we knew we had 100 kilonewtons, we need to multiply by that, that by 1,000, so that we have 100,000 newtons. If we had been talking about things in meters squared, we're going to need to multiply it by 1,000 twice to talk about it in millimeters squared. So stress, we typically talk about in newtons per millimeter squared, or MPA. And we know we can convert that back and forth to KPA if we need to. So we have some unknown area of a material and we have a force on it. What we're saying is, is rather than trying to define what that area is, let's just talk about it in millimeters squared in set, instead. And we can then talk about it as that force divided by the area or stress. If we had that same force over a smaller area, what do you think? Is the stress going to go up or the stress going going to go down? We have the same force spread over half of the area. What do you think? Well, we're going to have the same force divided by half the fit or area. That rearranges you could rewrite that as twice the force over the same area. And we're saying that we have two times the stress. So the same force on half the area is twice the stress. If we have a force spread over an area and we only took half of the force over half of the area, what do you think? Is it the same stress, lower stress, or higher stress? Well, we have half of the force divided by half of the area is the same thing as force divided by area. These two are the same things. And this is why it's really handy because all of a sudden it doesn't matter necessarily what the exact force and area are. We can talk about it as a unit element instead. So this is where I'm going to try to flip over to an example. Um, uh, you will be able to follow along with the video. You won't have the slides to go along with it, but you'll hear me talk about it. These will be the slides that you'll see come up. There will be two examples in a row, three examples in a row, and then we'll... Actually, what a good thing to do is, is for me to actually stop this here so I can thread these together. Okay, so I think we can understand stress pretty easy, and that tends to be one people kind of intuitively have an idea about. Strain is a little bit harder. People tend to get a little thrown off when we start to talk about strain, especially mathematically. I'm going to show you an example where you might possibly already have an intuitive understanding about strain. So strain is kind of funny that it's unitless. It has no units assigned to it. I find it handy to sometimes just write um, kind of where it came from off to the side. So strain, while being unitless, we figure it out by millimeters and millimeters, or millimeters divided by millimeters. So sometimes I'll kind of write millimeters by, divided by millimeters off to the side to just kind of help myself remember where it's coming from. Strain is the change in length divided by the original length. Seems like a kooky thing to do, doesn't it? But what it's doing is telling us how much something is um, responding to a force that's being applied or how likely it is to move due to some unknown applied force. The change in length is the final length minus the original length. And so that's our axial deformation. This little delta symbol usually represents change. And for us, our change is our deformation. So our change is our final length minus our original length. People often ask, why do we use the original length right here? And I'll talk about that in a minute. So here it is illustrated. If we have some unknown force on our object and we apply it axially, Let's just say, for example, that this one happened to be tension. You can see here on this elastic that if we did that, 
we get deformation happening over this whole thing. But look, also each little block is having deformation. And that's essentially what we're trying to talk about. So we have some delta L. There's our total length minus our original length, and we have our delta L. Strain is delta L, or our change in length, divided by our original length. Let's compare this to a few other uh, cases. If we had half of the original length, but we applied a load and it deformed the same amount, so only half of the original length, but the same deformation, so let's think about this for a second. Do we think that that's more strain or less strain? If you needed to move a smaller thing the same amount, did it take more or less effort or strain? Well, delta L divided by half the L is twice the strain. It was harder to make that deformation happen. If we had half of the original length and it only deformed half as much, is that more, less, or the same strain? Well, half of the delta L divided by half of the original length is strain. So both of these two objects have the same amount of strain being exerted on them. So now we'll go off and do a strain example. Actually, we won't do a math example yet. We're going to do a conceptual example. Because as I've said, people tend to have a hard time talking about strain. They don't tend to understand what it is. Hey Dave, could you come over here for just a second and show all the lovely undergrad students your face? <laughs> you just have to say hi for a second. Just say hi students. Hi students. You can go away now. <laughs> So, that's my husband Dave, brilliant engineer, and, you know, in the summertime, he's feeling good, he's feeling fit, we've been outside with the kids, getting active, going swimming, going running, doing all kinds of stuff. And Dave has his shorts that he puts on, and they fit perfect. They hit per fit perfectly just around his weight. That elastic band has no stretch in it whatsoever fall comes along, you know, Thanksgiving is around the corner, he starts to drink too many beer, eats too much turkey, um, and he puts on a little bit of weight. Well, he goes to put on those same shorts, and a little bit tight. He has to stretch that elastic band just a little bit. And then, whew, season goes along, and Christmas hits, the ho winter holidays hit, and uh, Dave starts to eat way more. The chocolate shows up, um, all kinds of snacks, wine, all kinds of yummy things. Dave goes to put those same shorts on and the elastic is stretched. Well, what we're talking about here, you've probably even talked about straining your pants, the elastics on your pants. In the first, in all of the cases, before he put the shorts on, the elastic band was the exact same length. In the summer example, he didn't stretch the elastic at all. There was no strain on that elastic band. In the fall example, he stretched that elastic band and there was some delta or some strain. In the winter example, he left, he went upstairs. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know if he knows that I have this slide. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I'm in winter pants. Yeah, you've got your winter pants on. Um, in the winter example, there is lots of change in that elastic band or more strain. The same original length has stretched more. We understand that that probably means there's a load associated with that, but we're not talking about the load at this point. We're just talking about how much it allows the object to move. So now we're going to go off and do a mathematical example. I am ordering a webcam camera so that I'll be able to just tilt something down um, and do the lecture with that. Um, 
it's kind of a bit of a play because they don't actually reimburse us for anything or it's difficult to kind of get that to happen. Um, so I'm going to try to find a, a webcam that I can get to make this happen for you guys. So in that example, we saw that one millimeter of movement caused 0.04 strain on our object. And I said that we use the original length. Why do we use the original length? You're going to do an example to, in the um, assignment that shows that it's actually not that much of a difference. But it is important, and here's why. The same material should experience the same amount of strain for the same amount of movement, no matter how we're talking about it. If we used the final length of the object, we would be saying, for this is for um, dividing by here, we would have one positive millimeter of deformation. So we've, we've stretched our object, maybe this one's a better one, dude. We've stretched our object one millimeter. So if we used our final length instead of our original length, we would have 26 millimeters. Our strain would be one millimeter divided by 26 millimeters or 0 0.0386. If we use the final length, but that object had been squashed instead, we would have a final length of 24 millimeters, and our strain would be 1 divided by 24 millimeters, or 0 0.04167. So even though these both would have moved the same amount, this math shows that they had different strains, and we know that's not the case. We know that the strain has got to be the same no matter what. So this is why we use the original length in this calculation. But you're going to see that overall it doesn't have a huge impact. So I've talked about these things mostly in real life examples right now, and you're probably saying, okay, whatever, we have a stress instead of a force, and we have a strain instead of a deformation. Why? Why would we do this? Why wouldn't we stick to talking about uh, force and deformation? Well, the reason is, is that we're talking about really, really, really big things that are also really, really, really stiff. And to figure out the capacity of things, we need to be able to test things. And we can't test full-scale buildings. It is hard. They're big. It takes a lot of force to fail them. Um, but what we can do is work with little tiny objects. So we have to be able to work with little tiny objects and have some way to extrapolate that information and apply it to big objects. So if this is our unloaded one, two, three, four, five story building, loaded, here I literally just copied the same drawing and put it right here to show it loaded and deformed. It would move millimeters. So if this is, um, you know, five, five stories tall, 25 meters tall, each one's probably only moving a couple millimeters. We're talking about five to 10 millimeters of deformation over 25 meters. So the load to make that happen would be extraordinary. The ability to measure that would be almost impossible. But what we can do is take really tiny, small bits of material and test them. And if we have done a few larger scale tests, we can compare that, see if it's a, 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 a realistic and responsible way to extrapolate that information. And once that's been proven, we can go ahead and use that math on large scale applications. So this is exactly what we do. Um, for t we have different ways of testing these members. Sometimes we'll use a cylinder of concrete. Sometimes we'll use um, a, a small piece of steel or whatever the material is that we're testing. Um, the reason we use cylinders and concrete is because concrete only really works in compression. It doesn't have really any tensile capacity. Um, we call our steel pieces, we often call them coupons or dog bones, um, our test piece. We can apply an axial load. Often for steel, we tend to do it in tension, just because it's kind of an easier way to get our machines to behave, but we can do it in compression as well. The problem is, is then we have to worry about buckling. So instead of just being able to squash it, 
if we try to do it in compression, we worry about buckling a little bit, and we don't want that to mess up our results. So steel is isotropic, which means it behaves the same in every direction, except for buckling, but that's not about the material so much as it is about how slender it is. And we'll talk about that more later. We'll often test steel in tension. So this all makes sense most of the time. And we really only care about normal. We don't worry that much about extremes of materials. And so what am I talking about here? These rules that we're talking about for stress and strain apply when we're talking about the range of normal things. So what's not normal? Well, when things have a phase change. So when we're going from um, uh, gas to uh, liquid to solid. Those are phase changes. Obviously, we don't want our buildings going through a phase change and we, we don't really experience that. Um, uh, temperature, extreme temperatures. So extremely, extremely cold so that it damages the material or extreme heats that can make materials behave differently and extreme stresses and strains. So I'm talking about off the charts. So a good phase change example would be an ISO hotel. When it evaporates, it, it undergoes sublimation and the, uh, the, um, the solid can turn direct, well, it can turn into a liquid and change into uh, a liquid. It can also sublimate and turn directly into a gas. And so we lose material. That is not strain. That loss of shape is not due to compressing the element. So that wouldn't apply to this. Steel in a fire. When it is so extremely hot, hey, okay. oh, you're the best. Um, uh, steel in a fire. Steel does not behave well in a fire. It loses strength in high, high heats. Um, that was uh, one of the serious, unfortunate um, things within the Twin Towers collapsing. As much as those buildings had been designed to withstand um, the impact of a plane that had actually been considered and the buildings did withstand that there was damage the intent wasn't to make the whole building be preserved but the building wasn't intended to collapse and it didn't due to the very massive impact of a very large plane hitting it um what had was a bit of a surprise to everyone and not and you could imagine it wouldn't be something you would think to plan for in a normal building although for for that scale of building it is something considered now was that the jet fuel burns at an extreme temperature more than our normal materials in a building would burn in a fire. Um, and so the steel lost strength much quicker than everyone expected. There was lots of other things happening in there that were surprises and not really the fault of um, a designer. They were unexpected things kind of all culminating in a series of incredibly unfortunate, um, uh, 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 into a, an incredibly unfortunate system. Um, but one of the contributors was definitely jet fuel burning at, I think it's like 700 degrees or something like that. Um, so it caused the steel to lose its strength and then all of a sudden it didn't behave the same way anymore. Extreme stresses and strains as you approach a black hole, for example, or even something with extreme gravity, so maybe the sun, we would start to see changes in stress and strain principles. Here's the really, really cool thing about this. We have stress and we have strain. There is, in the regular behavior of materials, a relationship between stress and strain. And that is what we call the modulus of elasticity, or our ability to talk about how much a material moves due to a force and its movement. So we can start to predict things with this. If we know the modulus of elasticity of a material, which we can figure out by testing small objects where we know what force we're putting on it, we know what size it is, and we can measure how much it moves, so we can calculate the stress and strain, we can calculate the modulus of elasticity, which lets us take it back to our big object and talk about it with an actual force and figure out how much it will actually move. So the relationship between stress and strain is stress divided by strain. So that's often called the modulus of elasticity. When we talk about it with steel, we talk about the Young's modulus. 
So, um, and a lot of what we're talking about today is talking about steel, but we're going to refer to it as the modulus of elasticity or E. So stress is in MPA and strain is unitless. So our modulus of elasticity will also be in MPA. So if we have this relationship between stress and strain, and we know that stress is force divided by area, and we know that strain is our change in length divided by our original length, well now all of a sudden, if we have been able to determine by testing the stress and strain of an object, and we can calculate the modulus of elasticity, when we go back to a big object, if we know any of these things, we can start to figure out the other things. So we can, we can put our stress up here and our strain down here, and then we can just rearrange it. This is just making it look less awkward. These are the exact same equation where a modulus of elasticity equals force times original length divided by the change in length and the area. So if we knew an object that we had because we picked it and we knew what load was being applied to it because we did everything we've done earlier in the term and we know how long our original object was because again we're making it be that long we can calculate how much it can deflect because or how much it would move because we know the modulus of elasticity from figuring it out from little wee tiny blocks or we can rearrange that equation to find whatever thing we wanted to know. If we know the modulus of elasticity, we've measured how much it moves, we know the area and the original length, well, we could figure out what force was on it. We could figure out the area, we could figure out the deformation, or we could figure out the original length. So depending on what we know, we can figure out the other bits. So doing these tests on the little objects lets us come back and figure out these things on our big scale, on our big actual objects. So what are some common modulus of elasticity, just to kind of give you a reference of what we might be talking about? Structural steel has a modulus of elasticity of 200,000 MPA. That doesn't mean much to you yet, I get it. I'm only gonna make you memorize one of these modulus of elasticity, and that is steel. You should know that the modulus of elasticity of steel is 200,000 MPA. I honestly don't make you memorize a lot of things, and a lot of structural engineering is actually a lot of memorization. I'm gonna be nice, and I'm not gonna give you many things you have to memorize. Memorize modulus of elasticity for steel, 200,000 MPA. I might even give it to you sometimes. But if I don't give it to you, you should know. If you see the term steel written, you should be able to say, oh, right off the bat, I know that the modulus of elasticity of this material is 200,000 MPA. Being really generous here by saying this. Stainless steel has a lower modulus of elasticity. It is less stiff. It will move easier under the same amount of load. Concrete and wood very, very small modulus of elasticity. We're gonna see that um, in the end, they're also a lot less strong. So we tend not to notice how, uh, how much less stiff concrete and wood are because we need so much of it anyway to make it strong enough that we tend not to notice how much less stiff it is because we've got so much more material. Where you might start to see it come into play is if we wanted to switch something to aluminum. Aluminum isn't as strong as steel, but it's pretty close. But it's only about as third as a third as stiff as it. So it might be strong enough with only half of the material, but now of all of a sudden it's going to move a lot more than the steel would. So understanding how materials relate to each other is really important. It's funny, Dave always talks about, um, it was tempered glass, right? Yeah. Being, um, he, he worked with a designer who said, oh, I really don't want to work with tempered glass. It's so flexible. It moves so easily. And Dave was kind of a little perplexed by that because he knew that 
it had the same modulus, elasti of, as, modulus of elasticity as the regular glass we might work with. And then he started thinking about it that because it is stronger, because it has, um, um, uh, it's, it, it's, um, it's been modified, it doesn't need as much material. So the perception is, even though we, because we need less material for the same amount of load, the perception is that it's much more flexible or much less stiff because we have less material. Okay, we'll go on and do um, an, an example for modulus of elasticity. Okay, now let's talk about the stress and strain related to each other. We already know that modulus of elasticity is a relationship between stress and strain. Well, that's the relationship between stress and strain in the normal range of things. We can actually draw that out for ourselves. It's the relationship between those two things. If we put stress over here and we put strain over here, the modulus of elasticity is the line between them. Or if you guys remember doing grade seven math, this is an equation. And our equation is E equals our stress divided by our strain. So here are a few terms that you should know. Um, I'm not going to be that cruel and make you memorize a lot of these, but I am going to show you a diagram that would also make a really fantastic exam question. So elasticity, it's the tendency of a material when unloaded to go back to its original shape in the opposite manner to which it became deformed. We apply that term pretty exclusively to an elastic band. Look, I can stretch this all the way out and it goes back to its original shape. I load it up and when I let go, it goes back to its original shape. If I took a very tiny paper clip and I put just a few pieces of paper in there, I would deform it. When I let go, paper clip goes back to its original shape. Plasticity is deformation of a material undergoing non-reversible changes of shape in response to applied force. What does that mean? Permanent deformation. So if I took this paper clip and I shoved all kinds of paper in it, look, I've got permanent deformation. My paper clip hasn't failed. It's still got some capacity to it. It hasn't broken apart or anything but there is permanent deformation to that. The interesting thing was, is when I did that, when I let go, it moved back just a tiny little bit. Feel free to go pause this and go find a paper clip and experience this if you'd like to. What's happening there is we're yielding the stress. It's allowing this bending to happen or this yielding to happen or permanent deformation to happen in the material without completely failing it. So yield stress is the point that we transition from that, that elastic behavior. You can see that that's elastic behavior. I'm putting a load on it and it's springing back, springing back. Yielding is when I exceed that and I put more force on it and it sprung back some, but not all the way. So at the yield stress, there will be some reflex or rebounding of shape, but there will also be permanent deformation. Now, some materials do not have a yield stress. When you hit the end of the elastic behavior, that's it, it fails, it's done, that's the end of that material, story's over. Some materials, yielding materials or plastic materials or ductile materials, we're going to talk about that in a second, can experience yield stress. So ductile is a material that can undergo large permanent deformations before they fail. So that means it is ductile. That means that is implied right there that there is a yield stress because we go along with our material and we're in the elastic zone and then all of a sudden we're in the yielding zone. So look at this, I am experiencing massive 
deformation, but my material hasn't completely failed. It's still got capacity. Look, I can still make it do things. Um, that is the fact that this is ductile. If this was made out of wood, when I tried to bend it, you would all know that that would just snap. If I took a popsicle, ah, I'm gonna go get a popsicle stick. Look at this, because I have small kids doing crafts, I have a popsicle stick. If I put deformation into my popsicle stick, there is elastic behavior. We bend it, it, can, it will go back to its original shape. If I bend it a certain amount, if I go past that point, I yield it. I have failed this popsicle stick. So brittle, this popsicle stick, was brittle. There was no yielding zone. When I hit the end of its elastic linear zone or its elasticity, it failed. The ultimate stress is the maximum stress a material can sustain or the final point that it fails at. For our popsicle stick, the end of its elastic range was its ultimate stress. There was no yield stress. Our steel has hit its yield stress, but it has not yet hit its ultimate stress. So let's take a look at our stress strain curve. Here is one for concrete. It's idealized. There's some more funny little things happening in there. Um, but this is our concrete material. And I'd just like to point out that this is actually a negative stress strain curve because concrete doesn't have any tensile capacity. It only has compressive tensile capacity. So I probably should have drawn it going this way, but this is easier to kind of talk about and look at. So you can see here is our modulus of elasticity. Here is, a, and, and the strain keeps going up and keeps going up. Well, if what we want to do is make sure our elements are strong enough and stiff enough meaning they don't fail, we don't care quite as much about this range. We want to make sure we don't hit the maximum strain and we don't want to hit the maximum stress. If we hit those points, it means we've gotten right here to the end of the elasticity of our brittle material and kaboom, we're going to get failure. Our material is going to bust and we will not have anything left. So we want to make sure we keep it in this zone so we can do all kinds of work talking about what's going on here. But what we really care about are these limits because we don't want to go past them. So there's our modulus of elasticity is the slope of that line. And we have a maximum strain and an ultimate stress. And that's what we care about. We don't care if we keep it somewhere down here. We just want to make sure we don't hit that limit. So you can see this had an elastic zone. If we loaded this to right here and let go, it would spring back to its original shape. Yes, even concrete has an elastic zone. It's just not that noticeable because we have so much of it most of the time. But it has no plastic zone. It is brittle. It also means it has no yield stress. It has an ultimate stress and only an ultimate stress. So let's look at a partial stress strain curve now. Here is our partial stress strain curve. Here is the modulus of elasticity of steel. And you guys all remember that it's 200,000 MPa. I normally make, there's only 200 of you uh, this year, but there's been years where there was 340 students in this class. And I, we actually taught in um, the Cineplex movie theater because the, the uh, main auditorium room in, um, at Daniels wasn't ready yet. And so I would make 340 students yell out 200,000 MPA every time I asked for the modulus of elasticity of steel. Um, so we have our stress here, our strain here, and we have our modulus of elasticity. And look, right here, we start to have our material yield. And then it keeps going. Something's still happening here where we're not increasing the stress, but we are increasing the strain. And remember, strain is about movement. 
but we're getting large movements with no increased stress. So that's our yielding. So we have our yield stress. Because we like to rename everything, and honestly, drawing Greek symbols when you're typing is a pain in the butt, I know it from doing all of these lecture series, that we often take shorthands. So instead of for steel and steel only, we stop talking about it being the yield stress. We call it FY. So FY of steel is the yield stress of steel. We have a proportional limit where there's kind of something funny happening in here. We're not going to spend a lot of time worrying about that. Um, but that's where we kind of start our yielding process. And then that's when everything in our, in our cross section is starting to yield. We have an elastic zone and a plastic zone. So in the elastic zone, if we're talking about this paper clip, when I do something that deforms it, it'll spring back. In the plastic zone, if I do something that deforms it, it will spring back a little bit, but there will be permanent deformation. That point is right here. So let's load and unload an elastic, or let's load and unload a steel element and show what it looks like in a stress strain curve. So exactly what I've been doing with this paper clip. So if I load it in the elastic zone, I load it up some amount. When I unload it, it's going to go back to zero it's gonna come right back to its original position. Remember, this is the measurement of how much it's deformed or its change in length. If I have, if I load it up, it's got deformation. When I unload it, it's gone back to zero deformation. If I load it into the plastic zone, I've loaded it and I've moved it some amount. When I let go, so I've moved it some amount, I've got permit, I've got deformation in it, when I let go, it springs back, but not back to its original position. So I've unloaded my, sorry. So here's my plastic movement. When I unload it, it's unloaded back along the line of my modulus of elasticity, but there is some permanent deformation left in it. We could do that, and that is what we call residual strain, where there's some permanent strain that's left from having moved this into the plastic zone. Remember, strain is about the measurement of movement or its ability to move, so we have some residual movement left over when we unload it. If we reloaded it from that point and unloaded it, the same thing would happen again, and we'd have more permanent movement with some elastic springing back. We can do that several times. So let's go now and look at our full stress strain curve for steel. This is a fantastic exam question. If maybe, I don't know, I drew this on the exam and labeled five points and told you to match those labels with the actual name, in a, a matching list would be a fantastic exam question. I say this every year, and about which means you should just have your stress strain curve in front of you for the exam, and inevitably five or six, 10, 20 people get it wrong when you just have to make sure you have the steel stress strain curve sitting in front of you for the exam. So let's take a look at it. We have that same little bit we've already talked about where we kind of come up on our elastic zone and enter our plastic zone. There's a lot of weird stuff that happens here in steel. Every material has its quirks. I mean, we all know, for example, water expands when it freezes. Water is a weird material. Not all of the other liquids do that. That is an unusual thing to happen. Well, every material is going to have its quirks. Not every material is going to have this bump that we see in our steel stress strain curve. Here is our yield stress for this particular piece of steel. And this particular steel happened to be 300 MPa steel. So if we put a stress on it of 300 MPa, which really just says if we know what size our object is and we know what load we've put on it, we know what our stress is. 
So if we load this up to 300 MPa, our little object is going to start to have permanent deformation. It will finally fail at some point up here, but in that zone, we're going to have lots of movement. We really just like to talk about our elements in this zone right here for the majority of the things we do in engineering. For steel, um, we do sometimes talk about the ultimate strength of steel, um, but most of the time we're talking about this zone right here for our steel materials. Here is our strain when the thing finally ultimately fails. So if I moved this paper clip around and around and around, it would finally strain, fail and we would have a large strain in it because it would have moved so much. If I loaded it some amount and then unloaded it, we would have permanent deformation. It would spring back some small amount right here but it would have had some permanent amount of deformation. The amount it deformed completely was the plastic strain energy. It took that much energy to completely move it. So we move it all the way up to here. There's two amounts of energy. There's the total energy, but there is the plastic strain energy, which was the amount that it per had permanent deformation. And there's the elastic strain energy, or the amount that is potential energy for it to snap back to its original shape some amount. The modulus of a toughness is how much energy it took to finally fail our object. And so if we took our paper clip and twisted it around and around and around, completing our strain, you can see we've got large amounts of deformation, huge amounts of deformation. So there was large scale deformation before we finally failed it. It took some amount of energy to cause that thing to spin all the way around. And that could be uh, calculated by the area under the entire curve at the point that it failed. And we would call that its modulus of toughness. Interestingly enough, you can feel heat on the paper clip when you do that. It's absorbed some amount of energy to do that. So what are some common yield and ultimate stresses? You can see we, I've listed yield stresses and ultimate stresses. Some of these materials do not have a yield stress listed. That's because they're brittle. They don't yield. They only have an ultimate stress, which means we load them in the elastic zone and then we hit the limit and they fail. Um, structural steel, 300 or 350 MPa yield stress, depending on what type of chemistry they use to make the steel, and an ultimate stress of 450 MPa. Remember, our modulus of elasticity was 200,000 MPa. Stainless steel, um, uh, not as strong. Aluminum, not as strong um, either. Brass, concrete, wood, uh, you can see concrete doesn't have much strength at all relative to our ultimate stress of steel and wood really not much at all. Um, it also didn't have much um, stiffness relative to our steel, um, which means ultimately we need more material to make the same amount of loads work. So we're going to watch um, a quick video now. Let me just... get us over to my thing. Mostly because I wanna talk about it. I hope it will record, I don't know if it'll record the sound directly. Hope you guys don't get some weird tinny effect happening. The 10 style test. First test, material with yield point phenomenon. In the first tensile test, a plain carbon steel with yield point phenomenon is to be tested. This is the test piece. It has a cylindrical test region with an original diameter of 10 millimeters very and an original gauge length of 100 millimeters. On my um, eraser here. Within this test region, distance marks have been drawn at original regular length. intervals. They help to visualize and measure the, the plastic behavior of the specimen. We'll talk about our cross-sectional area. 
So Using a hand control, the tester moves the upper crosshead into its correct starting position. Now he can place the threaded ends of the He's test in the, the lower um, and appropriate upper engineering the outfit. Machine. They've given him his uh, uniform to film this video. In the next step, he swings the extensometer into its working position and checks that everything is correctly prepared. Then he selects all necessary testing parameters on the control computer. Ready. The test starts and the extensometer's sensor so arms are carefully pressed onto the test to piece. To pull this way, the gauge the length can be measured piece. throughout the whole tensile test. And it's going to draw the gauge a length is displayed at the bottom right hand corner of the screen. Because they know at the beginning, it the amounts to 100 millimeters. And the cross sectional area. And During the tensile the test, the test piece is slowly moving. and constantly They're elongated going to with a standardized force speed. Deformation the force diagram. that the test but piece opposes exactly to the imposed strain. elongation is recorded and can be seen at the bottom left-hand corner of the computer display. The material behavior can best be observed in a force elongation diagram. The force F is being plotted upwards on the vertical axis. The elongation delta L towards the right on the horizontal axis. Remember, force related distress, At first, the force rises rapidly. L, force and elongation are proportional and form a steep straight line in the diagram. That's our elastic In zone. this area, the material Modulus behaves elastically. If the test piece were to be unloaded from this area, it would spring back completely to its original length. In materials with yield point phenomenon, the end of the elastic area can be seen clearly. The plastic deformation starts abruptly and is accompanied by a sudden drop of force. If the test piece were to be unloaded now, it would not spring back to the original length, but instead show a permanent elongation. So it would have plastic In the next stage of the tensile now. test, an almost constant force level with slight fluctuations occurs. This phenomenon is called the Luders effect. Don't worry about that. After a certain strain, known as the Luder strain, the force increases again. The material opposes an increasing force against the imposed elongation. Again, its strain don't, hardens. Don't worry about that too much. Up to the point of maximum force, the test piece is strained uniformly you along can start its length. To see it's starting to look a bit this more means like that the test piece gets curve. longer and thinner, but keeps a cylindrical shape. So you can see that it's even all along here. Now a really neat thing is going to start to happen. As soon as the maximum force is reached, a neck begins to form at one point of the test piece. So now we're losing also, the plastic deformation now only area. takes place at the neck, so and eventually the test piece fractures there. You'll see, see, you can see it's starting to lose its cross-sectional area now. And then ultimately it fails. So they're going to set it beside the original object so you can see how much it's deformed, and you In can the also recorded see force how... elongation diagram, the force FEH at the upper yield point can clearly be seen. This is the highest force the test piece can sustain elastically. FEL stress. is defined as the force at the lower yield point, Fmax as the maximum force. Or ultimate stress. We could convert Using these, these forces, the strength the properties of materials can be calculated. Stress. The upper yield strength REH is calculated by dividing the force FEH by the original cross-sectional area S0. They use different labels than us. The lower talking yield about strength REL is defined in a similar area. way. The maximum force divided by the original cross-sectional area is called stress. tensile strength Don't worry RM. about the fact that they use different labels than us. We're going to use stress, force, in and area. In the last step, the tester swings the extensometer back into its resting position and removes the broken test piece. This okay. marks the percentage elongation after fracture can be determined. This is the permanent strain after fracture so and amounts to about 30% in this example. This has Please note that the percentage elongation after fracture depends on the length to diameter ratio. Don't worry about percent elongation factor. By measuring the smallest You're diameter at the point of fracture, of the percentage reduction of area can be calculated.
It just so one of the more direct necking area area. I just wanted to show you in relation to the kind of original this. cross-sectional area. In the second okay, tensile we're test, do the second material one right in here. without yield point phenomenon was to be tested. So this is one that does not yield. It'll only in this have case, elastic this is a behavior. precipitation strengthened aluminium alloy. The test piece has so exactly the same shape and I no mentioned as the specimen in the first test. It is cylindrical with an original diameter of 10 millimeters and an original gauge length of 100 millimeters. After fitting the test piece into the testing machine and panning the extensometer into its working position, the test can start. Okay, let's get zip it forward a bit. Okay. So here they're doing the, the same test. The initial linear curve in the force elongation diagram again shows the elastic behavior of the material. But this time, the end of the elastic area is not revealed by a sudden drop of force or any distinct change. There is a smooth and gradual transition from linear elastic behavior to plastic deformation. No, they're not doing brittle. They are still doing a yielding one. I don't think we have a brittle the test. test. The force increases and Sorry. the test we are doing is um, uniformly. It is still yielding. Length. There is a yield point and we are getting large deformations. The neck develops. And, and there's a yield plastic deformation and there's an ultimate to this but they're much closer until fracture finally occurs there just to show you kind of two different as materials. a common substitute for the yield strength the 0.2 percent proof strength is used it is the stress so that they're causes pretty darn close to each other for that one as but we did get large deformation prior this is to the failure force that causes what we like about that is that we can um Let's just come back to this. So the thing we like about um, uh, uh, yielding is that it's a really good sign that we have a problem long before we have a problem. So we can have people get out of a building. We can say, oh, look, we're getting yielding there. We're getting large scale deformation. Maybe we have a problem and that we can fix long before we have a problem. So we really like ductile materials. We can make concrete ductile by putting steel into it because we know that steel is ductile. Wood's a little bit harder. Um, we can't make wood ductile, so we really limit our capacity of wood. We say, listen, wood is brittle. We're going to say that we don't trust it as much. We're going to reduce, we can say we know what its capacity is, but we don't believe that. We're going to go even lower than that. And then we really can make sure our connections are really, really good as well. So shear we've talked about, so that was really everything I wanted to show you about stress strain curves and the relationship between stress and strain for axial loads. I want to just quickly touch on shear and bending and what they look like, um, but you're not going to have to do any math with those, um, more just I want you to be aware that they exist. So our shear element, when we're shearing a plane, we get slippage between two things. And then the thing beside it slips as well. And the thing beside it slips as well. And we start to get it slipping like this. And the overall shape starts to turn into a diamond. Well, that's the same thing as... <sighs> the short side being pushed on as if it was in compression and the long side being pulled on as if it was in tension. So the internal forces on our element in shear can be related back to our axial tests. And our element in bending, well, we know that something in bending is experiencing compression on one side and tension on the other. For this example, it could be top or bottom, depending on how we're bending it. But we know that axial and, and compression, or tension and compression are axial forces. So we can come up with a relationship for bending stress and strain to our axial stress and strain. So by testing our elements axially, we can start to determine how they behave in shear and bending as well.
If I had more time, we would go through that math. We would actually do those calculations and figure that out. Alas, we do not have the time and I don't think it's fair for you guys to rush through it. So we're not going to do those calculations. I'm going to tell you that, and we've been able to see because we know how we can redraw those arrows, that shear and bending both have a relationship to the axial capability of a material. So if we can measure the axial capability and we understand what the math might be, we could figure out how what its capacity would be in bending and shear. So like I said, we won't talk about the shear stress equations, but shear, so remember for our axial force, um, uh, stress was force divided by area. So our, um, our, 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 uh, our force is the same thing as stress times area. So our force P could be, we could rewrite that equation to force equals stress times area. Our shear stress equation is very similar where it's shear equals stress times area again, or the element of the object that's looking after shear. Bending stress equations, or our moment is equal to stress times this S, or it's a section modulus. We're not gonna talk about section modulus much, but it is all about the shape of our object. Well, area was all about the shape of our object. S is all about the shape of our object. It looks like the relationship is very much related to our axial. Axial, our force, was equal to our stress times a shape property. Well, shear, our force, shear, is equal to our stress times a shape property. And our bending moment force is equal to stress times a shape property. We're also not gonna talk about Poisson's ratio or modulus for elasticity, but the Poisson's ratio is really just about the fact that when we squish this thing, we know that that shortening happens and that material goes somewhere and it bulges out the side. When we take a material and stretch it, we know that that material changes its cross-sectional area some. Again, we don't talk about it in the main equation, but when we get into the depths of the equation that's way beyond this, we do build that bulging and stretch and narrowing into our equations. And that's built in with modulus of elastic or our Poisson's ratio, which has a relationship for modulus of rigidity and E and Poisson's ratio. Those are things you don't need to know about, but I just wanted you to hear the words because sometimes you might hear it referenced in the material properties. So today we are going to no learn a little bit more about stress what just happened and there? Also, a, a different video just started to play on YouTube because it decided to. Well, that was fun. Let's see if I can get our lecture back. Here we are. Okay. So, the takeaway tips stress and strain relate to strength and stiffness, stress and strain are related. Modulus of elasticity relates stress and strain to each other. You should know the equations for stress the equations for strain, the equations for modulus of elasticity. You should know the modulus of elasticity and typical steel value, and you should know the steel and concrete stress strain curve. Just those, those ones that I told you. Concrete's pretty easy, it's just a straight line, then boom, we hit our ultimate stress and it ends. It's a straight line that is the line of our modulus of elasticity of concrete. Steel, has our modulus of elasticity or our Young's modulus for steel. And then we hit our yield stress and then a bunch of stuff starts to happen. And we hit our ultimate stress and we hit our, uh, our rupture strain. Um, and there's lots of things happening within that. But those are the main things that I want you to know about those. So that wraps up our stress strain talk. From this point on, we're going to be talking about specific materials. So we're gonna start with steel and we're gonna talk about how steel behaves, what basic construction looks like, what normal things are available to build with out of steel. And then rather than do actual calculations of the capacity of steel members, we're gonna talk about sizing guidelines and how you might put preliminary sizes on a set of drawings 
for a steel building. Um, and so we're going to start looking at those things next week.